So welcome to today's session. Oh no, I, I bear with me. I think. So welcome everyone to this session today. Let's go together. My name's Jane Knight. I'll give you a wave. There I am on screen if you're live. And I'm also joined by my colleague, Dr. Caroline Wilson. Hello everyone. Welcome. Welcome. The first slide explains that MEDRA came about in the mid-1990s. It was an ICH initiative. The MSSO was put in place to maintain and distribute MEDRA, and the activities of the MSSO are overseen by a management committee. The material that you see today is the property of ICH, as is MEDRA itself. You don't have the slides, so you're not able to use it. But if you do quote it in any way, you need to acknowledge ICH as the owners. I've explained that we like to make this very much a workshop format. So we use the questions panel to ask questions and to make comments. We may not all agree, and we are quite a large group today, so we may find we have differences of opinion in some of the comments, and in the interest of time, we may have to agree to disagree. We cannot take requests to code specific ver verbatims today through the questions, but what we will do is at the end, there will be a survey, and this gives you the option to propose new topics and new examples for consideration, but please make sure they're not so specific to your area that we're not able to use them. Sometimes this happens. This is how you access the polling software. So the easiest way is using a smartphone that you scan the QR code. Otherwise, if you want to use an internet browser on your computer or your cell phone, you open your browser like Safari or one of these and you type in pollev.com or Edge or one of those. Polev.com. You enter my name as the username, so you don't put your own name, it's completely anonymous, and this will allow you to join the presentation. But by far the easiest way, if you have a phone, is to do it on your phone. We'll show the QR code later if you need it. So here's the first one. Is anyone? It's unlocked. Yes. Where are you joining us from today? Somebody quick in there from Australia, somebody from North America, from United States, well, welcome, India, lots of you in Europe. Philippines, Australia. Philippines. Oh, somebody moved there. Turkey. Turkey, welcome Turkey. I think I saw some names in the list that I met recently on face-to-face -face training, some of you, so welcome. Lovely to have you with us. It's Colombia. Oh, early in the morning there. At least the clock. <laughs> Welcome. Wherever you are in the world, it's lovely to have you with us. So these are the credentials for the web-based browser. If you, do, you don't have to use these, you can use your own browser if you wish. You may choose just to follow along and not use a browser. So it's entirely up to you. The, the details are in the chat if you want them. We always start with a bit of an overview that in coding, there may not always be an exact match. Sometimes there may be several possible approaches. And even in the points to consider document, we see this offered as options. Sometimes it's a case that we understand the term differently and our brain can play, play tricks on us sometimes. We see things that may be relationships between reported events which are not always necessarily there. Sometimes it's that we need to represent events by what we call a best approximation. We do the best coding we can. And that's what some of the examples in these Let's Code Together webinars show, where it isn't po always possible to get the perfect match to an LLT. Overall, though, we always code as reported without making any assumptions. And here, what I would say to you is your brain can play tricks on you sometimes. We always have a picture like this one. When I look at it, I see the center portion is spinning. And this is so it, it's it's a case of doing the best we can and being aware that that does sometimes happen. Ask a colleague because it can be that your brain can play tricks. We see things differently. It's a balance overall between applying rules for consistency and using medical judgment so that we manage risks to patients. 
medical references can be helpful for understanding the report, making sure we're not making assumptions. And sometimes it's a case that we need to request a new term to be added to MEDRA. So having said all of that, let's code together. And I'm going to switch my video off at this point so that it's not distracting for you. So our first example today is took herbal supplements to reduce menopausal symptoms on the advice of a friend and without informing her doctor. She then experienced an increase in blood pressure, possibly due to an interaction with her prescription antihypertensive drug. So we've got several things mentioned here. We've got the indication it would be the menopausal symptoms. We've got that, first of all, that's the reason she's taking it. It's a herbal supplement, but the problem is that there's an increase in blood pressure and it's possibly due to an interaction. So this is a long verbatim. Caroline's going to put it in the chat for us so that you can look back if you want to see what it is. Is that the questions we might be thinking is what be, is being reported? Is it a drug interaction? If it is, what type of interaction? And we'll take a look shortly at the terms in MEDRA that capture interactions. And how can we capture all of the reported events here? So how would you code this reported event? And as I say, Caroline's put it in the chat so you can, you can refer to it there in, the, in that section. Which of these would you select? I've given you a choice of... LLTs, you can choose more than one. I'll give you a couple of minutes. It's a long verbatim to take in while you're voting. I'll just explain that we've got, we've, today's verbatims have come from examples that we've been proposed, as well as some that we've come across ourselves. And we, we've got some really exciting examples for you today, I think. So if we do go too fast, then let us know in the chat that we're going too fast, because I know I went quite quick there to try and get as much of the session for you to look at the examples. So let's have a look at how your votes are lying now. Oh, well, blood pressure increased is clearly is, is the most popular choice. And that was one that was mentioned, wasn't it? A split there, hypertension worsened, blood pressure increased, inhibitory drug reaction, herbal interaction and drug interaction have all been selected by some of you. So let's see, we'll freeze. Oh, what happened there? We'll freeze the poll. And let's have a look at what we've got. So the concept of drug interaction is a patient is taking a drug and they take some other, either a drug, device, substance or have a disease. So there's some other factor which interacts with the drug they're taking. And as a result, you have a drug interaction. A problem occurs. It may result in an enhanced effect of a drug a side effect of the drug or decreased effect. It's not necessarily always going to be a, a side effect of the drug as a result. MEDRA has terms for m several types of drug interactions. So we, it would be a combination of a drug with another drug or a herbal substance, which we have in this scenario. It might be an interaction with food or alcohol, tobacco or other Ill illicit drugs. Radiation even, there's a term in MEDRA for that. Medical devices can interact, as can diseases, and even your genetic makeup of a, of a person. So these are the type of interaction terms to be aware of when you are looking to code. The MEDRA terms available here are all within the General Disorders and Administration site conditions. The HLGT is therapeutic and non-therapeutic effects. And the HLT is specific to interactions. So that's, I think that's worth pointing out that remember in future when you do come to code an interaction, it's worth knowing where they are because you might not automatically think of them as being within the general disorders. And here are some of the terms that are available for the, the types of contexts that we saw in the wheel there, the different types of interaction. There are also some 
additional PTs added in version 27 and I couldn't fit these on my slides. So we've there are a few newer ones added in the most recent release, but this gives you an overview of the, of the context in the wheel, as well as potentiating drug interaction and inhibitory drug interaction as separate PTs under the same HLT. The points to consider document, here we are, the March, re that's last year's, I'm sorry, I didn't update it. This is a slide we were using in last, the, the last points to consider, the example got, um, the last Let's Code, the example got carried forward. So apologies, it's last year's points to consider document, but just to show you the guidance hasn't changed. When the reporter specifically states that there's been an interaction, then we code it. And this is what the guidance tells us. Only when it is specifically reported that there is an interaction. If it isn't specifically reported, you just code the consequences. So the examples there, we see the patient was taking two drugs together and developed syncope. So syncope is coded. You just code the consequence. If it isn't clear, if there's just a temporal relationship that two drugs are being taken together. So that's the guidance. And I checked the guidance was still correct, still the same. I just forgot to change the front cover. I do apologize. The also point from the points to consider that is relevant to us here today with this one is that when you have a possible diagnosis, the guidance in the points to consider document tells us that the preferred approach is to code both the provisional diagnosis and signs and symptoms. So bear that in mind as well. Let's have a look at what our verbatim said. So took herbal supplements to reduce the menopausal symptoms on the advice of a friend without informing her doctor. So there's no issue there that it's anything to do with prescribing or off-label off or in any way there. It's she took them herself. Herbal supplements, she experienced an increase in blood pressure. So we've got a lab result reported and it's possibly due to an interaction. So that's why I shared with you the provisional diagnosis guidance, because if we apply the same principle here, we would code the consequence and the, the possibility of that as a diagnosis, possibly due to an interaction, and we know the drug. So we would apply the coding guidelines from the points to consider document to code the interactions which are explicitly reported. We would never assume an interaction, and that's the earlier guidance I showed you there. But we do apply the points to consider principle for a provisional diagnosis here. We would browse MEDRA fully. I haven't taken the time because I think you, you, you could all find those terms for yourself in this. You, the, in the interest of time, I've just shown you the principles. So here we would code the LLT or PT of herbal interaction. That's the one I would choose. I would also code the consequence, which was blood pressure increased, and ensure that the menopausal symptoms and the pre-existing hypertension were also captured. So that was quite a quick one there. Any questions or comments on that? We've, I've chosen the, I chose the herbal interaction. There were a few interaction terms available in the multiple choice. I chose the herbal interaction because we know specifically it is a herbal supplement that's taken. It's not two drugs. It's one drug with a herbal, and that's why I've selected that one. Okay, I'll move on then and hand over to you, Carol Ann. Yeah, there were no questions, um, Jane. So let Wonderful. me... Thank you. Let me share my screen. Here we are. Here we are. So next it is reported that a physician mistakenly prescribed a drug for a patient which was contraindicated in patients with that particular genotype. So do we understand what this is all about? What is being reported? Does this verbatim refer to a medication error or something else? Is this again a case, a case of a drug interaction, in this case with a specific genotype? And what would be the most appropriate LLT or LLTs?
So and Jane has put it um, the verbatim in the chat so that you can see it. So what would you do with this verbatim? Which LLT or LLTs would you select? Drug prescribing error, contraindicated drug prescribed, off-label use, contraindicated drug administered, labeled drug genetic interaction issue or labeled drug genetic interaction medication error, and or drug genetic interaction. What would you do? I see that many of you are voting already. Always look at the verbatim, try to keep as close to the verbatim as possible. Let us look what you're going for. Here we are. So the most favorite is contraindicated drug prescribed, but some of you would also select drug prescribing error, off-label use is an option. So there's a split of opinions here, but the favorites are contraindicated drug prescribed and labeled drug genetic interaction medication error. Let me close the poll and let me switch to the browser. Here we are. I log in with my credentials. Here's the browser. So one option was contraindicated drug prescribed. So let me search for it. Ah, indication typo. Then there will be no contraindicated drug prescribed or contraindicated product prescribed. So when I look into the hierarchy, right mouse click, go to the browser. This really reflects what has been reported, contraindicated drug prescribed. Drug pres product prescribing error, here is the drug prescribing error, would be redundant because contraindicated drug prescribed is more specific. We also have the option to code to off-label use. If you look into the hierarchy here, you see that there is an HLGT for medication errors and other product use errors and issues, and that there is a separate HLGT for the off-label uses, because off-label use would not be suitable in this case, because the term off-label use describes a conscious decision by a healthcare professional, in this instance, a physician, for therapeutic purposes. And in our case, an error was made by the physician when prescribing a drug for the patient. Contraindicated drug administered would be would uh, represent an administration error. So let us look for this term. Here we have contraindicated product administered, contra contraindicated drug administered. Again, this would not be suitable. Look at the verbatim. It was not reported that the patient finally received the medication. We don't know. What about the labeled drug, labeled drug and genetic We have the labeled drug genetic interaction issue and the labeled drug genetic interaction medication error. Both are grouped under separate. PTs. The label drug genetic interaction medication issue, well, this is a vague term. We know that the drug is contraindicated for the particular genetic variant of the patient, meaning that this drug genetic interaction is documented in the label. And it is not an issue, an unspecified problem, but we know that the prescription of the contraindicated drug occurred in error. So, if you're not clear about the meaning of these, uh, these terms, refer to the MEDRA concept description and you can find them here in the browser. By clicking on this heading header here, MEDRA concept description, and selecting the L, labeled, labeled drug disease interaction medication error, labeled drug interaction medication error, drug foot, here is the drug genetic interaction medication error. This medication error refers to the situation when a patient is prescribed, dispensed, or administered a drug that is documented in the drug label 
to cause an interaction with patients with particular genetic variants. And there's an example with, uh, with um, ZIP uh, 2D6, poor metabolizers. So because we know that this all occurred in error, the issue term would not be appropriate. The, the LLT labeled drug genetic interaction medication error is the would be the correct assignment. It is a relatively new PT, which was added in version 25.0, which more specifically captures what has been reported, that a labeled drug genetic interaction was ignored in error. So what about the drug genetic interaction? Here it is, the LLT, right mouse click, go to browser, and we can check in the hierarchy. And this, of course, is grouped under HLT drug interactions. So it, it represents a drug genetic interaction. And assignment of this LLT would not be suitable because no interaction was reported. We, we even don't know whether the drug was finally taken and whether a drug genetic interaction could occur. So let me switch back to my slides now. Jane already showed that there, is, uh, there, are, there are quite a few MEDRA terms representing specific types of labeled drug interaction medication errors under the HLT product monitoring errors and issues in the system organ class injury, poisoning, and procedural complications. And you can see it on the slide here. And if you are unsure of the meaning of these PTs, refer to the MEDRA concept descriptions, which you can access via the MEDRA browser I've shown you. You may now argue that LLT contraindicated drug prescribed does not explicitly capture the fact that this was made in error. But it, first of all, it is hard to believe that a non-observance of a contraindication by a physician is done on purpose. And also, the PTC document for MEDRA term selection provides useful guidance in this respect. So in the first example here, we are told that the patient with renal failure is accidentally prescribed a drug that is contraindicated in renal failure. And we are asked to code to label drug disease interaction medication error, accidentally prescribed, and contraindicated drug prescribed. Because by assi assigning um, a suitable LLT for the labeled interaction medication error, we already capture the fact that this incident occurred in error accidentally. And the LLT contraindicated drug prescribed provides more specific information, first of all about its nature, that a contraindicated drug was prescribed, um, that a contraindication was ignored, but also about the stage in the medication use process where the error took place at the prescribing stage. And another example in the document is similar to our verbatim. Here we have precise information regarding the particular genetic variant of the affected patient, so uh, ZIP um, 2D6, poor metabolizer, and this needs, of course, to be captured. And also the drug was finally administered. It was taken, and this has to be captured as well by assigning LLT contraindicated drug administered. And of course, also the label drug genetic interaction medication error needs to be captured. In, Jane, in Jane's previous example, an interaction actually occurred. It was suspected. Here, no interaction is reported. We even don't know whether the drug was finally taken by the patient. What we definitely know is that this incident occurred in error and at the prescribing stage. And you could see that MEDRA offers several very specific terms for coding such scenarios. So always browse MEDRA carefully when looking for suitable terms. Here we are. Our final suggestion is to code to LLT and PT labeled drug genetic interaction medication error 
and to LLT contraindicated drug prescribed under PT contraindicated product prescribed. Are there any questions, Jane? No, Caroline, no questions. Just a few people haven't accessed the poll. So when you do the next one, if you could re-show the QR code. Yes, I will. Thank you. So next one. A patient reports that the medication did not eliminate the pain, but only made it more bearable, more tolerable. Is this verbatim clear? Do we understand what is meant? Is this a report of ineffectiveness of an analgesic drug? And what would be the most appropriate LLT or LLTs? Again, your turn. Which LLT would you select? It's obvious that MEDRA contains very granular terms for similar scenarios, so try to keep as close to the verbatim as possible when making your decision. Therapy partial responder, drug effect less than expected, drug ineffective, inadequate pain relief, drug effect incomplete, and or patient dissatisfaction with treatment. What would you do? Medication only made my pain more tolerable. See you voting still. So let's see what the trend is. Again, split of opinions, but the most popular decision is drug effect less than expected or inadequate pain relief. So let me close the poll. And um, as mentioned before, try to keep as close to the verbatim as possible. The PTC document for MEDRA term selection clearly states that we should not infer a lack of drug effect uh, if not reported, explicitly reported. So do not assume code as reported. Let me switch to the browser again. Here we are. And look for therapy, none and response. Therapy non response responder. Go to browser. Here we are in HLT therapeutic. You see there's a lot of PTs in this HLT therapeutic non and non therapeutic responses. Here we have the therapy non responder. So this term refers to the treatment response based on the individual characteristics of patients like demographics, gender, age, and clinical characteristics like concomitant diseases, etc. We don't know whether the individual characteristics of the patient led to the fact that the drug could only partially relieve the pain. It was not reported. This would be an interpretation. So the term is too specific for our coding scenario. What about drug ineffective. Where is it? Drug ineffective. Here, of course, in the same HLT. This was not reported. Remember what I've shown you in the, uh, in the terms of selection document. The medication made the pain more tolerable. So if at all, it would be an incomplete drug effect. We have, of course, drug effect Let me drug effects incomplete. Here it is. Go to browser and we see it in the hierarchy again. It's grouped under therapeutic product effect incomplete. So would this LRT be suitable based on our verbatim? It seems that the patient expected that the drug would eliminate the pain. But was that the purpose of the therapy? Can we assume that the medication is supposed to take off the pain completely? 
We don't know. This would again be an interpretation. Next one was inadequate pain relief. Here we are. And when looking at the hierarchy, we see that it's grouped under therapeutic and non-therapeutic responses, but also under sock injury, poisoning, and procedural complications, under anesthetic and allied procedural complications. An inadequate pain relief is grouped under inadequate analgesia. So this term is considered a synonym of inadequate analgesia and has a secondary linkage to HLT anesthetic and allied procedural complications. Inadequate pain relief could be due to an incomplete drug effect, but could also be caused by an inadequate, inadequate dosing by the uh, anesthesiologist. So this LLT is not suitable for our verbatim either. Another option was patient dissatisfaction. Oops. Separate the words. With treatment, here we are. If I click on the verbatim, we already see that this is a term in social circumstances. So this would not be suitable. And um, last but not least, we had the drug effect. Less than expected. Here we are again. Go to browser. Look at it in the hierarchy. It's a separate. PT, drug effect less than expected. And this LRT actually best captures what has been reported. It covers the aspect that the drug is only partially effective in relation to the expectation of the patient. It reflects the patient's point of view on the expected drug effect. And this is, of course, uh, different from uh, an objective um, measurement uh, for the therapeutic or any any effect that the that the respective medication may have. So it's the expectation of the patient that is not fulfilled. That's why I said, look at the verbatim, code as close to the verbatim as possible. Here again a screenshot from uh, the Medra browser showing all PTs under HLT therapeutic and non-therapeutic responses plus the PT patient dissatisfaction with treatment in so social circumstances. And um, drug effect less than expected is the best approximation to our verbatim. And here are our learning points. Because of the granularity in this area, always search top-down in the hierarchy to get an overview of the coding options. Check your verbatim and keep as close to the wording as possible. Do not assume, do not interpret a lack of effect, if not clear from the information provided in the verbatim. Our patient had the expectation that the drug would eliminate the pain, but it only made the pain more tolerable. So the verbatim describes the patient's perspective, the patient's expectation, and it was not accomplished by the drug. Our final suggestion is to code to LLT and PT drug effect less than expected. Any questions, Wait. Jane? Yes, Caroline, we've got one question and we've got one comment on the previous example. So let's do the question on this one first. This is a relating to the term patient dissatisfaction with treatment. If mm -hmm. the patient had clearly stated that he was disappointed by the effect of the drug, would you then have also selected patient dissatisfaction with the treatment? Yes. I would. I would always try to capture all information that is provided. And you will see it in one of the next examples. Thank you. That's good. So let us know if that answers your question. Um, then the comment we had was on the previous. Nothing else on this one so far. On the mm -hmm. previous one about the um, 
monitoring error the the um or the genotype or contraindicated drug mm -hmm. and the 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 comments from martin are that if it's in hindsight and it's due to an adverse event you discover it in hindsight that the it it was contraindicated then can you say then that it was a monitoring error if the information wasn't known at the time of prescribing? This is a difficult speak? question. So if it's, it's, if it's not really in the label, because it, it, of course the term refers to the label, if, if it's a labeled contraindication of the drug, then you would need to, to select this, this term. If it's not yet in the label, um, it would be a monitoring um, monitoring error. If you don't know about it, I don't think that it's considered can be considered a monitoring error, because if it's not yet in the label, no warning letters uh, distributed by by the health authority, then um, you, it cannot be expected that um, the the physician is aware of 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 uh, this potential contraindication. Uh, and then the follow-up, thank you, Caroline, the co follow-up comment from Martin is that he said he often gets questions from coders that things are only errors or off-label use in hindsight, like coding an off-label indication, but actually the patient's condition could have been misdiagnosed and only treatment response led to the correct diagnosis and change. Mm -hmm. So uh, interesting. Yeah. that's an interesting thought on that one, isn't it? The benefit yeah. of hindsight. Um, and yeah. then going back... Thank you for those comments, Martin. And then also coming back to the, the question you've just, the, the example you've just done, regarding the patient's expectation of treatment, aren't we assuming that his or her expectation that the drug was supposed to be reducing the pain, the expected drug effect was not explicitly stated in the example? So is it an assumption that the drug was supposed to be reducing the pain? A drug effect less than expected is, is for me, is it's a general term. So it, it it's really reflects the patient's perspective, um, and um, we don't know we don't know whether the drug was um, supposed to take away the pain or whether it was only uh, taken. We even don't know the indication. Maybe it was a, a, a cancer patient, so you wouldn't expect that in a in a cancer patient with really very severe pain an analgesic even if it's if it's a strong one opioid would take away the the pain completely so it isn't um yeah it is an expectation of the patient that cannot be fulfilled and the drug effect less than expected really best captures the fact that it's an assumption from the patient's perspective that um that the effect of this medication would uh, be that the the patient is is, is completely eliminated. Uh, and and I I going looking at the verbatim, Carolyn. When we saw this verbatim, we read the verbatim that the patient was expecting their pain to be uh, yeah. reduced more than it was done. So we, we don't see that as being a, a an assumption. The wording of the verbatim suggests to us that. It, it was expected to attack the pain more than it did resolve the pain. Sorry but for that's that. Another question. Thank you, Caroline. That's a question so far. Oh. We are in demand today. We we uh, that's all we have. So you can carry on. Okay. You, oh, if, if you need to go, I can do my next one. Just let me know. No, I've tried to to mute my phone, but it doesn't seem to work. Sorry for that. Next one. Similar, similar verbatim, same, same context. Here it is reported that it seems like if the effect is sometimes stronger, sometimes weaker. So is our verbatim clear? Can we code right away or do we need more information? And what would be the most appropriate LLT for coding purposes? Again, here you have the verbatim. It seems like if the effect is sometimes stronger, sometimes weaker. And again, we have many options that at first sight seem to be somehow suitable. Subtherapeutic response, 
you may consider split coding and code drug effect increased and drug effect decreased or drug effect variable. There's the option to code to therapeutic product effect variable, therapeutic response change, or you may decide to seek clarification from reporter. What would you do? Many of you are drug effect variable, therapeutic effect variable seems to be the favorite assignment, therapeutic response change also, but many of you also vote for C clarification from reporter. So let me close the poll and again switch to, whoops, switch to my browser. Here it is. So we could consider split coding by selecting drug effect decreased. Go to browser. Here we are in the same HLT, of course. And here is the drug effect decreased and therapeutic product effect decreased. And here is the therapeutic product effect increased and uh, with the LLT drug effect increased. It was reported that the effect was sometimes stronger and sometimes weaker. But do we know that the product was a drug? We don't know based on our verbatim. It could refer to a medical device or a combination product or even radiotherapy, etc. Drug effect therapeutic um, product effect variable, here we are, with the LLT drug effect variable. Same problem, the LLT nicely captures that the effect was variable, here sometimes stronger, sometimes weaker. So no split coding would be necessary anymore. But again, we don't know whether the product was a drug or a therapeutic medical device like a cochlear implant, an insulin pump, for, for instance. So subtherapeutic response, was the other option. Here we are, go to browser. It's grouped under therapeutic response decreased. Our verbatim states that the effect was sometimes weaker, yes, but sometimes it was stronger. We would miss part of the information when selecting this term only. And in addition, our verbatim does not specify that the expected therapeutic response was sometimes weaker or stronger. It only refers to the drug effect, so it could uh, also relate to undesirable effects, to side effects. And the same problem we have with the LLT therapeutic response changed. That was the other option. Um, our verbatim describes a variable effect and does not specifically refer to the therapeutic effect or response. So it would be best to request additional information about the product in question to be able to code more specifically if you're coding out of context in a central coding organization. Of course, if you are coding in pharmacovigilance in the case processing chain and um, then you, you have the information about the drug or device whatsoever, but um, otherwise in a central organization you would, you would query. And um, if not possible, if you don't get further information, you could select LLT and PT therapeutic product effect variable. We had that before. Therapeutic effect, product effect variable. So we would not select the drug effect variable because we don't know whether we are um, dealing with a drug in this instance, but therapeutic product effect variable is a more vague term that captures what has been reported, that the effect 
is variable and it does not refer to the therapeutic effect but is more vague just refers to the effect of, of um, the respective medicinal product. Let me go back to my slides. Here we are again the screenshots of the browser and the respective uh, PTs that um, were uh, affected by our poll and therapeutic product effect variable would be the best option um, in this instance. As mentioned in the previous example, because of the granularity in this area, always search top down in the hierarchy to get an overview of the coding options, check your verbatim and keep as close to the wording as possible. We could see that Medra offers many different terms for the different medicinal products like drugs, medical devices and other therapeutic products. So to be able to code specifically, ask for the therapeutic product in question when coding out of context. And do not assume, do not interpret, but stick to the information provided in the verbatim. So we suggest to query in order to obtain information about the product in question if you are coding out of context. And if no additional information can be obtained, assign LLT and PT therapeutic product effect variable, because this best reflects what has been reported here. Any questions, Jane? No, no, Caroline, not so far. I think our audience are probably still taking it in, just thinking it through. So thank you for that. We'll let you think a bit longer while we move on to our next set. Yeah, so I give it back to you then, thank Jane. You. Thank you, Caroline. So now, uh, let me go back to where I was. Just bear with me. Here we are. So now I have three examples which look at the context of verbatim reports and how we take this into account, or should we take it into account. So the first example we have is sweating after eating. So what's being reported here looks quite simple, doesn't it? The patient is sweating, but is the link to eating important to capture? And what would be the most appropriate LLT or LLTs for this one? That's the questions we're considering. So here's our poll. How would you code sweating after eating? We have several sweating option terms here for you. We've got sweating, excess sweating, sweating attack, night sweats, adverse food reaction, gustatory sweating syndrome, or would you seek clarification from the reporter? On the face of it, it looks like such a simple term, this one, when you actually start to think about it. Well, I've given you some of the options. Some of them are LLTs under the same PT, but still it shows you the options available. If somebody's eating, if they mean dinner, do they mean night sweats? When are they eating? What time of day? And is that even relevant? Is that a different medical concept? How are you doing? It's quite a, yeah, still voting, I see. Okay, so let's see where your votes are. The poll will still be open for you. So the, by far the most popular choice is sweating. Some of you have gone for excess sweating or sweating attack. Nobody's gone for night sweats, I'm pleased to see. No, a few of you have gone for adverse food reaction. Have we been told that? Gustatory sweating syndrome, some of you have selected, and some of you are seeking clarification on what, as I say, at first it looks like a quite a straightforward term until you start thinking about it. So let's close the poll there. Sweating's our number one choice. And let's browse Medra. So we'll go back to the to the browser and I'll show you this time. So let's see what we look for. So let's look for sweat. First of all, I'll look for sweat, not sweating. Oh, sweat. Remember that it's always better to look for word stem when you use the browser. 
one of the, the basic principles of using the browser. We get 54 terms that include the word sweat, but we need to try and exclude some of the things which might be test results. Or, so what have we got here? Cold sweat, sweat glands, drenching sweats. That's under the PT of hyperhidrosis. So is excess sweating and heavy sweating, all under hyperhidrosis. Night sweats we didn't choose because, there were, of course, it doesn't say in the verbatim it's anything to do with night time. Then we've got some sweat test results here. Just the term sweating, which is also under hyperhidrosis. Sweating attack, also under hyperhidrosis. And then we have that gustatory sweating syndrome. So this one's under auriculotemporal syndrome. So this looks like something, this is really something quite specific. So before selecting a term like that, even though it talks about gustatory, which to me suggests taste and food and eating, uh, I, I wouldn't want to choose that without a lot more research. So we could go to hyperhidrosis and have a look, go to browser. We see that the sweating term is in the skin and subcutaneous disorders, system organ class, there it is, hyperhidrosis. It's a skin problem, and there are all these different ones. In Strictly, it wouldn't matter if we were looking for one of these. We would choose the closest to the reported wording, which is probably sweating. Sweating attack, it would be an assumption in a way, but sweating suggests that would be the one. We don't know it's excess or heavy. Sweating attack, you could select. It wouldn't make a lot of difference to the analysis because it's under the same PT. But before we see that, let's have a look at the placement of this. Just out of curiosity, some of us did select this gustatory sweating syndrome. So let's have a look at this one. Where is this? So this is, if we look at the hierarchy, this is now in the gastrointestinal sock. So a completely different sock. It's under the salivary gland disorders, not elsewhere classified. So this, the hierarchy is again making me think that this is something very specific. This is, I've been told somebody sweats after food. I haven't been told they have this, which looks very much like a diagnosis. So let's go back to our slides and see where we go next in our thought process. So next, I would go to some valid medical references. We use Dorland's as our medical dictionary, as our go-to. There are other medical dictionaries, but this is what we use. We to, um, And I've just put a note there that it is worth, when you browse, look for things like postprandial, gustatory, anything which suggests the relationship to food. So it is good, good to have a look for an analogy which does suggest food because there are some terms like that include the words postprandial, but there's nothing for sweating. There was no postprandial sweating. Only this strange term here that we think is means more. So let's have a look. Gustatory uh, hyperhidrosis. So it's a, a synonym of auriculotemporal syndrome, and it relates to sweat, redness and sweating on the cheek in connection with eating. Many people have it mildly after eating spicy or sharp foods. Sometimes have it more, some people have it more severely after surgery or damage to the nerve or the parotid gland. So again, salivary gland problem. It does have other other synonyms there, but that is not making me think that it is just simply sweating after eating. It makes me think there's more to it than that. So I wouldn't feel comfortable in making a diagnosis myself by choosing a syndrome term that like that. If there had been a term which just suggested the temporal relationship, sweating after eating or postprandial, for example, but there wasn't anything. So we've, we've searched with the reporter's words. I've looked at all the LLTs under the selected PT. Really, I'm looking at hyperhidrosis there as the PT. I would use references if there are any potential terms that pop up when I'm doing the brows, that particularly if I don't really understand what the conditions mean. I would not make assumptions or diagnose when I'm coding. We always code as reported. But if we feel that there might be something there in the mind of the reporter, which hasn't been explicitly described, we may always 
choose to seek clarification for the diagnosis if unsure. And I've lost the F there, sorry. Seek clarification for the diagnosis if unsure. So overall, I would agree with the majority of you that the LLT sweating under the PT of hyperhidrosis is the best option. And you do have the option to seek clarification for a diagnosis or understand the reporters to, to understand the intended relationship to eating. But when I only have the context, I wouldn't be looking to make a diagnosis based on that. Any questions, Caroline, or comments on that selection? Would it be wrong if, if we code drug interaction as well? Oh, no, that one is, I think that relates the, to the earlier. Let's relate to the other one. No, okay. I think so. Okay. Because that was there before. Good. So then there is no questions. Okay. So if anything occurs to you, you've always got the option to put it in. So here's another term that tells us the context of the symptom. We have inflammation of finger after manicure. So what goes through your mind here? You probably have a picture in your mind of someone who's been to have something done and they've now got inflammation of their finger. But what, pick, what part, I wonder, of the finger are you thinking? Is it linked to the, is the inflammation linked to manicure? It says after manicure, but is there, is there anything else? Is it just temporal or is it something causative there, causal relationship? So what would be the most appropriate LLT? How would you code this one? So I've given you a selection of terms there. The first one's one that you may or may not be familiar with, dactylitis, finger injury, inflammation localized, skin inflammation, nail bed inflammation, nail fold inflammation, post-procedural inflammation, or would you seek clarification? Yes. So let's see where your votes are lying. Yes, the poll is still open. You can carry on voting. Let's just see. Inflammation localized is very popular on that one. Post procedural inflammation is partly. We have a difference of opinion on this one. A couple of you have chosen dactylitis, finger injury, skin, nail bed, nail folds, or seek clarification. A real mix, apart from the runaway winner, inflammation localized. So let's close the poll. There we are. So referencing, I'm going to share with you the reference from Dorland for the, the first time in the list, which was dactylitis, which very few of you did select. Inflammation of a finger or toe doesn't tell us much more than anything more than that. Dactylitis, inflammation of a finger or toe, which is seemingly what's been reported. So let's browse Medra and have a look and see what we find there. So now I'm going to, I'll have a look for the placement of that term dactylitis to show you first of all before we look up some of the dactylitis. Here it is. Let's look at the hierarchy of the term. It's PT of dactylitis. It's under the musculoskeletal and connective tissue disinfections and infl inf inflammations. Musculoskeletal sock dactylitis. So go to the browser, look at it in relation to its brothers and sisters. We can see there it is. It's under a number of terms there, which are actually primary elsewhere, connective tissue inflammation. So quite a general term, really. The, a lot of these terms are primary elsewhere. We see they're green. So that I, I'm still holding that in my mind as that I still think that's a possibility. I won't rule it out yet. So let's have a look at inflammation. We're probably going to. Uh, let's have a look at the nail. Should I put nail? It was finger that was reported, wasn't it? So we've got nail bed inflammation and nail fold inflammation. Well, these look like they could be 
quite neat in linking to the manicure, but they've told us it's finger inflammation. They haven't told us that it is nail bed or nail fold. So here, I think that would be an assumption of the part of the finger that's inflamed. So although they are linked to the skin and it looks nice because we know in our head that the patient has been for a manicure, that would be an assumption. So then we're looking at our localized inflammation which is a more general term that a lot of you liked, Lo inflammation localized under PT of inflammation. And we can open the hierarchy. It has a, two links, one into the immune system disorders and one into general disorders as under the HRT of inflammation. So there's no assumption being made there. If we select that one, there's no assumption being made, but it is quite general. We're not capturing the site of the inflammation. So that's probably the... The, the most we could consider, we can have a look at it. There might be some other terms around the inflammation there. We could have a look more closely in this HLT of inflammations and have a look. There are the terms underneath inflammation. We could spend some time and have a look at these if there's anything else that we may have missed. So that's where we are. So let's go back to our slides and I'll share with you my thinking on it. You've probably guessed. So my thinking is don't make assumptions. We've emphasized that several times today. Code as reported and reference medical concepts, which may be unfam unfamiliar. Exactly the same logic that we applied in the previous example. My selection would be dactylitis because based on the references that I've been able to find, it does refer to inflammation of the finger. There's no there's, there's nothing in that verbatim term that says it's an injury, nothing that says it's due to the manicure or even that it's skin. So we don't even know that it is skin that's affected, but we do know that it's a finger. That's why I would choose dactylitis and I would be happy to be more specific than just inflammation localized. But it may be that we have difference of opinion. Any comments on this one, Caroline? I think I'm afraid, seeing the voting, I'm afraid to ask in case anyone's got strong opinions contrary to my views. So there's two, com there's two comments. One uh, saying that um, why not con uh, considering post-procedural inflammation? Ah, yes, that's interesting. Thank you for reminding me. I put that. The reason I didn't choose that one is because it's a manicure and it's I, so when I see that term, I think more about medical procedures rather than procedural. But you might say, well, the manicure might be regarded as that. It, yeah, I, I think because of the connotation of it being a medical procedure, that's why I didn't choose that one. Yeah. And we also have the comment that uh, one could capture the skin cosmetic procedure or something like that. Yeah. To capture the manicure in order to, to have this captured and, and um, yeah. show at least the timely relationship of the inflammation of the finger to this, um, to this manicure. Yes, you could do it that way. Um, you could do it that way. This, it, we know so little, it's such a vague term here, inflammation of the finger. You could seek clarification to ask, well, what is inflamed? Because it could be that it's an injury to the patient may have some other underlying condition which makes them more prone to uh, inflammation, more, more vulnerable. Uh, it could be that there was an injury happened. We don't know that. All we know is that the finger is inflamed and that's why I've selected this. You could seek clarification. You could choose the inflammation localized, but I felt that this was better because I'm capturing the site. Yeah. There's one comment that uh, is saying that dactylitis is an inflammation of the entire digit, but I think this is not the case. So parts of the digit would still be considered in uh, dactylitis. But well, yes, we, don't know. We, mm -hmm. we don't know that it may be the whole finger. We don't know whether it is the whole finger or just around the nails. Just because they've had a manicure doesn't necessarily mean that it, we can assume it's just around the nail or that it's a very small part of the finger or that it's even just skin. 
it's it is a very vague term really it looks straightforward again when you see it and your brain tries to make sense of the manicure why have they told us it's after a manicure unless it's re re related and that would make me think if i could query is there a relationship and what part of the finger is inflamed an interesting mm. term and there's one comment maybe you can um, discuss this as well um what what about this uh, my suggestion to code to swelling of fingers peripheral swelling for this example because it's so vague um inflammation is more than just swelling we tend to my when i was learning to code somebody taught me that inflammation is swelling redness heat and pain mm -hmm. and so just by having swelling just i wouldn't code to swelling because that's just one of the elements of inflammation and we we don't know whether there were two or more of them and which of them were present here in this patient have you got anything to add, Caroline? Feel free to chip in. And, and no, everything is um, is clear for me. Thank you. Interesting term, I think. Yes, <laughs> lots of of comments. No, so, yeah. Yeah. Also, wouldn't duct delitis be a diagnosis? Yeah, it's a diagnosis. Inflammation is of it, the finger. It, it, is it a diagnosis? Maybe. So then, your inflammation localized would be safer. Um. I, I, I don't think we could say that any of those are strictly wrong. It, they're, different, they're different socks. I just felt that I, I felt in using my judgment that I was capturing the condition and the sight. So here's another one for you along the same lines. Now we're moving on to hair dye. We're leaving manicures. Burns to scalp and ears after not reading the instructions on a home hair dye kit and incorrectly mixing the solutions. So what do we have here? Burns to scalp and ears. And we know the underlying contributing factor is not reading the instructions on the hair dye kit. What's being reported? Do we code both the error and the outcome? And what would be the most appropriate LLT? Do we, is there an error there that we can capture? Should we capture? We talk about medication errors so much, don't we? If we put it in a different context, do we need to capture it now? So let's have a look what we've got here. We've got burning sensation in ears, burning sensation scalp, burning skin, chemical burn of skin, application site chemical burn, burn of face, head and neck, burn of unspecified degree of ear, singed hair, and burn. Lots of options for you there. You probably thought it was quite straightforward if I hadn't given you all those options. I'll give you a moment. Could you show the QR code? Oh, I forgot yeah. to do so. Oh, Jane. sorry. I know some of our attendees have been typing their answers in, which is fine. It just means you don't see your vote mm -hmm. on the screen. If you type them in. So let's see where your votes lie now. Burns to scalp and ears. Chemical, no, application site chemical burn is the runaway winner on this one. Chemical burn of skin is also there. And then the others lesser, all equal really. Few choices, nobody wants singed hair. Good. And we post, oh, where am I going here? A couple of you must have chosen burn. So application site chemical burn is the choice here. So let's look at, I'll show you my thought processes. So my thought processes were, what is scalp? Where does scalp? And I had a look also in the Medra introductory guide to see where the scalp was mentioned, what, what, 
body system does it relate to? It wasn't in there. So I had to look in Dorland's just as a conf confirmation what I thought that scalp is skin exclusive of the face and ears normally covered with hair. So it's looking at the, the, the extent of the scalp as well as the tissue type. So now I'll browse. My next thought would be, well, I've seen that it's skin. I, I'll, I'm going I'm to go, because I know it's burns, I'm going to go to the injury poisoning and procedural complications, and I'm going to do a top down. Let me just make my browser slightly larger for you. So I'm going to do top down, injury, open injury, injuries by physical agents. So I've got exposures, chemical injury and poisoning, injuries by physical agents. Let's have a look there. Under injuries by physical agent, that's where I find burns, but they're heat injuries excluding burns, conditions by cold. Then I have the HLT is thermal burns. So this is the issue we have with some of the burns we might have, have selected. Even just basic burn, thermal burn, is under thermal. And we know that it's chemical. So this HLT is not suitable for us, what we're looking for. We need to look under the chemicals. If we can, let's find something that relates very much to the chemical injury. So chemical injuries now is the HLT. And this is where we see all the chemical burns. I'm going to rule out in the polling the burning sensation terms because we know that they were actual chemical burns. So burning sensation is it was just a red herring for you. So we're not going to follow up on those. I'm going to look for the closest chemical burn terms. So we've got chemical burn of several sites here, including skin, chemical burn of skin, the LLT and PT there, as well as some other sites or just general chemical burn. So ears would be considered skin, scalp would be considered skin. So I like this one, chemical burn of skin, caustic injury, chemical burn. That's less specific, just chemical burn, because we don't capture the tissue type being skin. So of those, I like those. Now, let me have a look for those of you who selected the application site burn, application site chemical burn. So here we do have an application site burning, application site chemical burn, and application site thermal burn. So let's have a look at this, so application site reactions, administration site reactions in the general disorders. That's the primary placement of that PT. And I can also look in the concept descriptions as a reminder. I'm sure a number of you will be well familiar with this. Application site is the considered to be the surface that contacts a topical medication in the form of a cream, lotion or patch. It does not pertain to other methods of drug delivery such as injection, infusion by catheter or other means. So I've now got two terms. I've got your, your favorite, which was the application site chemical burn. And I've also got my chemical burn of skin that I found when I looked top down. Of the two, I have concerns using the application site because the, here we see that application site relates to drug application and we're talking about a hair dye unless that is maybe your product in for your company if it's just if it's a, a look the suspect drug is a different drug there's no reason to select application site because it's the context of what the patient was doing rather than the fact it was a medication error in miss in mixing wrongly or application site in where it was used because it's not a drug so that's my thinking on this one I would select a term from the SOC of injury poisoning and procedural complications to reflect an external cause. And you saw me do that with a top down approach. I would search for a term to reflect the type of burn. So make sure I'm choosing a chemical burn and not a thermal burn. And I would look to match the sites. And here I was happy that skin covered both scalp and ears. I personally am not looking for any term that would capture incorrect mixing of the solutions because it's not a drug and there's nothing to suggest unless I knew that this was my product which was being tested as some kind of cosmetic needing regulatory testing. 
Um, and I wouldn't then be treating it as, a, as an application site. I would select chemical burn of skin. Any thoughts, Caroline? I think we have uh, answered all the questions because there were some questions whether we should, in addition, select something for product compounding error or preparation error. But this is really referring to medication errors and we are not talking about the medication or medicinal product here. Unless you're you're working and that is your product and you are doing testing for some reason, some specific reason that we're not aware of, I would see that that's unlikely. Mm -hmm. I'll hand over to you, Caroline, for the next one. This is there's one additional um, oh, yes. question. I don't know if you have shown it. If there is a term for an application site burn caused by a drug. Um, yes, there is. That was the application site. No, only application site burn. Chemical burn. But mm -hmm. chemical burn, here it is. I can go to browser so you can have a look at the brothers and sisters just to be sure. So it's in general disorders. It's under administration site. And we have application site burn, chemical burn and thermal burn all fit under the same PT of application site burn. So no reference to drug or product there at all. Just the application site, which we saw from the concept description, refers to a drug or product. OK. OK. I'll hand back to you then. OK. I will make myself presenter, show my screen. Here we are. Our next verbatim describes a capsular contracture in scar tissue leading to a breast asymmetry and an overall poor appearance the affected patient is unhappy with. Do we understand what is being described here? Does it represent a post-procedural complication or is it a complication caused by a device or a prosthesis? or an implant, what would be the most appropriate LLTs to capture this information? So because splitting would be necessary, we have quite a number of, quite uh, several information or several different aspects in this verbatim that need to be captured. So how would you handle this report? Capsular contracture and scar tissue patient unhappy about breast asymmetry and overall appearance. So now please, if you, if you have access to a browser or if you have uh, looked at our examples when you have received the verbatims beforehand, what would you select here? Which LLT would you select? Capsular contracture associated with breast implant, yeah, very specific term that is available here. Exactly. So this captures the first part of our verbatim. What about the scar tissue? Nobody's considering the scar tissue. All of you are looking for the capsular contracture. Complication of breast augmentation surgery. We don't know whether it was a breast augmentation surgery. It could have been um, really a prosthesis after radical mastectomy, for instance, in a cancer patient. So the capsular contracture um, of, um, of the breast implant already captures the fact that there is a post-procedure complication. I don't think that we need to capture the post-procedure complication in addition. So here, capsular contracture associated with breast implant and skin scar and breast asymmetry. Yes, the breast asymmetry needs to be um, captured as well. Correct. Implant scar, yeah, there's a more specific term either, even. So we have captured the capsular contracture with the breast implant. We have the scar tissue at the implant site. 
and we have the breast asymmetry that you have uh, proposed. So let me close this and continue. And first of all, what is the difference between the term prosthesis and implant? So implant is the more general term um, because it's, uh, it refers to an object or material such as an alloplastic or radioactive material tissue partially or totally inserted or grafted into the body for either prosthetic, therapeutic, diagnostic or experimental purposes. So a very general term, whereas prosthesis refers to an artificial substitute for a missing body part such as an upper limb, lower limb, eye or tooth, or even breast tissue used for functional or cosmetic reasons or both. And this is also confirmed on an FDA website here. Medical implants are devices or tissues that are placed inside or on the surface of the body. Many implants are prosthetics intended to replace missing body parts, other implants, deliver medication, monitor body functions, or provide support to organs and tissues. Now we come to the capsular contracture. So a capsular contracture is the hardening of the breast around an implant, a breast implant. And the cause uh, of this capsular contracture is not known. And uh, the severity is divided in four grades. Um, known as Baker grades. So let me search for the LLTs that were proposed in our poll. If I search for caps and contract, so always using word stems, Jane mentioned this already. Here we have the Capsular contracture associated with breast implant. So this was, is the most specific term, a very specific term that we can find. If I click on it, you see that it's grouped under complications associated with device. So here we already have captured the complications, the complication. We don't have to, um, to assign as an additional term for a post-procedural complication. We have the complication already captured with this PT. What about the scar tissue? We know there was an implant and the scar. If I look for it, I find the implant side scar. So this perfectly captures the other part of um, our verbatim that there's a scar tissue around, of course, the implant site causing this contracture also. Then we have um, the information that the patient is unhappy about the breast asymmetry and the overall appearance. So what about the breast asymmetry? Here we are. Perfect match, breast asymmetry under the PT and isomastia. So again, we have found a very specific term. Now, if I, what we have to capture in addition is that the patient is unhappy with this procedure outcome. This also needs to be captured. It's, it was reported. So this I would expect in social circumstances. So I would select the SOC social circumstances restrict my search to this system organ class and just look for patient, for instance, and see what there is. So we have the patient dissatisfaction with device, with treatment, and with procedure outcome. So that's the perfect term for our reported condition. So patient dissatisfaction with procedure outcome, it is grouped under patient dissatisfaction with treatment. So with this, we have captured all the information that is uh, reported in, uh, in our verbatim. Let me continue. Here we are. So for coding 
the reported scenario, we had to take into account that the reported adverse events were related to a previous surgery and a breast implant. And as always, we would have to capture all reported information, all reported findings. And it wouldn't be sufficient to just code the reported capsular contracture, the scar tissue at the breast implant site and the resulting breast asymmetry. But we would also capture the fact that the patient is unhappy with the procedure outcome. So here we are. We would code to LLT and PT implant site scar, LLT and PT capsular contracture associated with breast implant. We would code to the LLT breast asymmetry under the PT anisomastia, and we would code to LLT patient dissatisfaction with procedure outcome under PT patient dissatisfaction with treatment. Any questions or comments? A couple Jane? of comments. That I thought contracture is scar tissue. I think you've addressed that one when you showed the well, the definition from the FDA website. So contracture is scar tissue, but we found a closer term. And how do we know that there is an implant? Yeah, but um, if you look into breast and capsular contracture, that's always related to the implant. So that's what you see in literature. So in this instance, if you're not sure about the concept or the, the condition that is reported here, it's always useful to look, uh, to search in the internet what is meant by that. So here it's fully clear that this only relates to a breast implant. And going back to Jesse's question about, well, why have we coded? I think the question is, why are we coding implant site scar and capsular contracture? It's because we've been told both of them and we don't know where the scar tissue is, if it's necessarily internal or on the surface at the scar. So safer to... Yeah, could, yeah it's safer. It's it's at the implant site because it's uh, it's reported in, in um, together. But uh, we don't know whether it's uh, really scar tissue around the implant or whether it's uh, near the implant because of, of the surgery itself. So it's always safer to, to, to capture both. And also the scar tissue, then there is scar tissue and the scar tissue somehow is also related to the capsular contracture. So both are, are to be coded. We don't have more information. So I would capture both um, findings. Martin's reaffirming that as well, Caroline. The capsule is always around something, so in context, it is the implant. So, yes, thank you, Martin, for that comment too. So, uh, Caroline, looking at the time, it's 10.28. Um, we've done eight examples today. Our next example, shortening leg, has already been carried over at least once, uh, I believe. So um, I wonder yeah. if we should stop for today. I hope who so we had a request following last time's session to deal with implant and prosthesis and explain the difference between the two. So if you were the person who asked us to do that, I hope we have done it for you. And we um, let us know if it's still not clear or you want something else. And you'll have the option in this. Do you agree, Caroline? We'll pause there and carry the next yeah. two examples over next, next time. Yeah. When is our next time? Do you do you remember? Our, I oh, 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 I think in June. June. Yeah, in June. We don't have quite as many this year because we're doing face-to-face -face training. So we, we don't have quite as many as we've had in previous years of Let's Code Together this year. Here's a survey for you. Um, I, I, uh, hopefully that's open. Yes, I can see your, your voting. You have to share screen. Um, oh, Jane, you have to. Okay, well, it's, it's active, but I need to share screen. Okay. Um, Yes, here it is. Let's try again. Sorry about that. So here's the survey for you that you'll be able to carry on. Tell us if you do have topics you'd like us to cover. Please tell us what you thought of the session today, how we can improve it. We, we do take all your comments on board. We can't always make the changes that you ask for because you might ask for something and a number of other people might ask for the opposite. So we do review everything, make what changes we can. And we, we enjoy doing these sessions and want to make them as useful as possible for you all. 
So just I'll let you doing that. A reminder for you that I mentioned at the beginning that we don't distribute the slides for these sessions. We do make the recordings and we store them on our YouTube channel. So there's a playlist that you can look at all of them together that Carol Ann and I have been doing this now for a number of years. So there's a lot of them there going back to the end of 2020. And if you wonder, well, which terms are covered in which of the sessions, then you can see in the information in YouTube which verbatims are covered in each session. And to make that even easier for you, I'll just show you while we are here. On our website, if you go to our website under training, you go to the training materials you'll find there that there's a list of all the trainings we offer. Under coding, you find the section for Let's Code Together, and there's a term index as well as a document explaining what, how the index can be used. So I'll click to show you the term index. This is a way of checking what verbatims have been covered in each session. These are all the English speaking sessions. So it includes our US colleagues as well when they do the sessions. And you can look at the date. This will help you look in YouTube to see which ones you're most interested in. And they, they type a link so you can click. There are the dates. You can also look by, we've categorized them. You know how coders love to code everything, categorize. We've classified them by category. So they don't relate to body socks, but you can actually look and see which terms there are that you can, um, you may want to see. So this will show you the alphabetical by category. Here they are. We can see what we've put under ambiguous and vague. You get the idea. So there we are. Combination terms and also as well as some body sites. So anything else to add, Carol Ann? Nothing to add, Jane. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Carol Ann. Here are our regular links to the website. We really appreciate your input today, both the voting and the comments. We, as I mentioned, we enjoy doing these sessions very much. So we, it's a, a pleasure to share with you our thought processes. And we look forward to seeing you in June. If you are here for the whole session, you'll be eligible for a certificate, which you download from the self-service application in two days time two days time. So thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Caroline, for your collaboration. And thank you again. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you all. Bye-bye. Have a good day.